Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Strife's Sanctum. My name is Citizen Strife, and this week I'm going to be talking about an anime that, at first glance, and maybe first run through, may not seem like much, but I recently rewatched all the way to the end of season three, and I have to say, it's much better on the second rewatch. And that is Ascendance of a Bookworm. I'll do anything to become a librarian. And, um,. Ascendance is one of those things that, when I first watched it, I kind of felt the same way I did about Spice and Wolf, where, obviously I think Spice and Wolf is better, but only slightly. But in the sense that it's kind of doing a thing where it doesn't seem all that interesting at first, and then it peels back some layers. Spice and Wolf, I think it focuses more on the relationships, between Holo and Lawrence, and that's what really carries the show. This is carried by this never-ending sense that it's just comfort. In you know what you're getting, the shows don't try to be much else, but it's giving you a world, and it's slowly peeling back the layers of the world. And I dealt with this to my frustration with... I'd say the devil was a part-timer in later seasons, but this one gave you enough time to invest in tone. And this is very much more dramatic. The comedy is there, but it's very subdued and not really intense and in your face. Like I said, the same way as Spice and Wolf is. And I think that's to its advantage. And I'll talk about this later whenever I get around to part-timer. But that show was trying way too hard to be a comedy at first. And then later on, a bunch of stuff, story and plot-wise, that didn't jive with its tone because it's trying to be comedic still and there's no stakes involved. This is a show that's about 75% drama, if not more so, and it sticks the landing because when it needs to get intense, it doesn't feel out of place. And that's important. Because if you try way too hard to maintain your comedic background, and, and I think Ruby, to its detriment for a while, felt this. And I know, I understand, as I said with Ruby, people love the comedy stuff. They don't really like the, the lore anymore. But you need to get over that and get into that intensity more and then stick with that if you're going to go that route this is a show that kind of does that because it's it, it is trying to do stupid comedy here and there mostly do to oh my god i love books you know i'm gonna make books but it never feels like the comedy is in spite of itself other than a, a few things and a few snide comments here and there it's still a dramatic show with some action, with some lore, and as far as Isekai go, it's one of my favorites. So, what makes this show different? Well, it's focusing on bookmaking and merchantry. So, how do you create books in a new society using your knowledge from now? How do you m navigate the world that is based in somewhat magic, but mostly priestly uh, druidic magic? that you're gaining from the land, and then how you do that and navigate political intrigue from the perspective of a church that kind of runs the entire world and nobility. So nobility versus classes. So you've got a classism angle there too. I think this weaves an interesting narrative from the perspective of we'll start slow, take you each season into a journey, and get you somewhere else. Now, again, I don't know. I'm pretty sure they're not done. I haven't read the manga version, but I know at the end of season three, which I've gotten to, a lot of stuff happened. And there's only so much you can do. And I think one of the main criticisms is that there was a lot of time lapses and time jumps and a lot of stuff that gets taken out for the sake of doing a 12 episode show per season. There's only so mu so much you can do. I still think that the anime adaptation is f is good enough at guiding you where you need to go for each season for it to make sense, so that you know don't feel like you're getting 
just ripped from one aspect to another. And I'll explain that. But the back the backstory is girl ends up in a new world and she was a bookworm or a librarian's assistant or something like that. Pile of books fell on her because that's how isekais work. And then she ends up becoming this world's version of mine. So her original name, which is brought up a couple of times, is Arana Motosu. Mine is the name that she goes by because she takes over the body of this frail little girl. Um, she's voiced by Reba Burr. And the thing about mine and this world is that she's suffering from a... I, I wouldn't know if it's a fatal disease, but one that you can control. It's called the devouring. And much like... Magus Bride, where the magic power is overwhelming you to the point that you're going to lose your lifespan, this is kind of the same deal, except that it happens in children. There's not really a way around it unless you have money, and a lot of it, and she's born into a very poor family, a good well-to-do family, and I think that's the first half of the show up, God, even into the third season, when they take a back seat away is the family dynamic. Because even before anything else, the first season is about showing mine as a little girl, was like five, six, seven, learning how to deal with this new family of hers. Um, the Gunther, voiced by Kaiji Tang, Effa, voiced by Kirsten Day, and especially Thule, voice, voiced by Lisa uh, Raymold, they care about mine a lot. They don't really know that they're not talking to the same mine anymore. They, they think about it, but there are only a couple of people that actually know. Um, the first one who finds out is a friend known as Lutz, voiced by Jeannie Tirado. This is a boy that's helping her out because the way that her illness works is that she is just frail. She is prone to blackouts. She cannot really move very well. For all intents and purposes, like the next step up from being bedridden all day is pretty much where she is. A slight breeze or a slight exertion, even if she wants to, can make her prone to attacks. The devouring kind of happens and manifests during stress. And she usually has to be carried through life. And it doesn't become a burden to the family, especially the, the dad, who unfortunately dotes on her a bit creepily. But, you know, it's it's not to the point where it's too bad. It's just meant for stupid comedy here and there. But Lutz is the first to find out. Because Lutz's whole thing is he is going to be Mind's assistant. She has all this knowledge that she can use in this old time society to learn how to make books out of different th uh, different materials. So she spends the good chunk of the first season learning about merchantry and learning about how to make books mostly for her own self satisfaction. She doesn't really care about doing anything else, but she finds out she needs money to stave off this illness. So she's trying to do what she can with the body that she's been given and having an assistant who knows her secret. You know, there is some issues here and there where Lutz is like, you're not the person I remember. And that's one of the cool things about rewatching this is I forgot how poignant and how intense those scenes were. Because every so often, there's like four or five times where the the show it is kind of stuck in where it's going to be like pretty good, but not amazing. There are flashes of brilliance of intensity of these like very dramatic, either action scenes or character moments where mine is threatened and put on the spot. And it gets really sad some points. And that's one of them. Lutz figuring out that mine is not the girl that she knew. And, most often wasn't even there anymore because mine is essentially a new person. Whoever mine used to be is no longer in existence. That's kind of scary. So they go over it a little while and it's still something that's always going to be present there. So that first season is just them going to a merchant guild run by Benno voiced by Joker from persona. Yay. Xander Mobius. How are you doing? Um, 
he plays Benno as this kind of slick, well-to-do merchant, because of course he is. And his whole thing is he's willing to put up with Mine's bullshit if she gives him information. And also, they have to kind of go back and forth. Much like Spice and Wolf, there's like a back and forth trade going on here and there. You do this thing for me and I will do this. I will give you a new you know, new recipe of something I learned. Maybe we make some food. Maybe we do this. Maybe we try a new bookmaking method. So the first season and a half are just them bandying back and forth the the notions of hey i've got all these books or i've got all this stuff that i'm learning and benno didn't think anything of it until later but he will and then trying to stave off other people from figuring out including a, a girl named freda who constantly keeps saying come to my guild instead i'll give you items to keep staving off the devouring because i have it too you know so so you have that competing interest in there too the first season goes about, and you learn about this thing called the baptism. And it happens, I think, age seven. And uh, again, the, the show, the anime, does a lot of time skips. That's one of the main criticisms I've heard, is it just goes fast. But there's only so much you can do if you're trying to make a 12-episode show. If this was like 24, 24, 24, I'm sure they would spend a lot more time doing a lot more things. But they're going by 12 episodes, so they have so much they want to do. And, you know, season one is getting to the cathedral and learning about it. As the baptism happens at the end of season one, things start happening, and mine ends up becoming an apprentice priestess because her devouring is something that nobility and the the priesthood definitely like and definitely want. And that's where she meets the secondary main character, uh, Ferdinand. And Ferdinand, uh, voiced by Armin Taylor, he acts as narrator, he acts as confidant, she, you know, like anything that she needs, he does. Because he's in sort of a power struggle with... There's a high priest and a head priest. High priest doesn't want her around. She, he's a fucking dipshit. Just this old Santa Claus looking dude, you know. But Ferdinand is just this, I'm better than you and I know it. You know, kind of, you know, kind of smug, you know, but very matter of fact. And it works as a dynamic because mine is still trying to be kind of goofy at times and airheaded and doesn't know anything. His whole thing is... What am I doing here? What am I dealing with this girl for? But then realizes how useful she is because of the devouring stuff, but also because of her brain. And she is the, he is the second person who finds out that she isn't who she says she is. But then ends up realizing that that is a commodity that can be exploited because the classism angle that had been kind of permeating starts to hit in the second and third season. So the second season is mostly about learning to be a priestess, but still doing all the work. She ends up, you know, running an orphanage and also you know, keeping up with some of her guild responsibilities as a merchant, you know, with Lutz's help. And you start understanding the the mana stuff. You start understanding the magic stuff. You start getting the fantasy stuff added into the book, you know, the book making. It's still there, but you slowly start to peel back the veneer of, oh my God, I'm here just to make books to, hey, I'm actually learning about how the magic system and priesthoods and all that work. You start learning that people who are orphans that are gray, gray robed people are basically downtrodden and spit on essentially there's an orphanage where people are not giving any given any food like in most cases blue robe priests eat priests and priestesses eat their own food and then they give leftovers to their servants the orphanage doesn't get anything they just have these like there's a scene early on in season two where they walk into the orphanage and it's like a wasteland in there it's all dark nobody's taking care of everybody's just dying in there and mine takes it over and cleans it and does all the shit she has to work through how to deal with her servants who are all kind of different one of them wants to be helpful the other one really doesn't but he's being a snotty nosed brat about it the other one is snitching on her to the high you know the high priest 
in lieu of becoming somebody's concubine, which I guess in that society is fine. I don't know the mechanics of, hey, you're a seven or eight year old girl. Do you want to go and live with a noble for the rest of your life? That's kind of icky. I mean, yeah, it's meant to be. I don't know if that's how life used to be, but I'm not used to that sort of thing. And, and again, this is not a show that's very depraved. Depraved is the word. It doesn't show anything bad like that. Just the inclination that that's what happens to kids of that age and that one of them wants to get the fuck out of the orphanage just to be somebody's concubine. I mean, that's kind of weird. But season two keeps going and keeps going and the high priest learns about things. He tries multiple times to try and trick mine into either signing contracts or getting the fuck away from her parents or whatever. She ends up going in one of those spurts where the devouring kind of explodes out of her. And it manifests in a cool scene where she actually, like, wrenches his heart to the point where it almost causes heart attack and heart failure. She has that much power laden in her as a character that this seven-year-old girl can just, like, force crush somebody's heart and almost succeeds if it weren't for Ferdinand taking control and saying you're not going to do this and i kind of hoped that that high priest would have gotten wrecked because he just did he deserved it he's a fucking dickhead but but ferdinand stops her and then you finally realize oh crap yeah there's something hidden there's something there that i need to channel into something so while she gets cured of the devouring or at least temporary, you know, halted, they have this like ritual that she feeds her mana into items or different rituals so that she doesn't have the devouring. It's like a, an over full cup. You know, if it flows out, shit like that happens. And then she gets in worse shape. She needs to be less stressed. She needs to deal with that. So, Ferdinand also offers these specific like rites ceremonies. As I said, they start slowly building in the lore. There's these different gods going on and different things where these gods and goddesses created the earth and the elements and you channel magic through those elements. And some people take it seriously, some people don't. And mine is learning about that. So again, you're taking the bookmaking stuff, you're taking the church going stuff, now you're getting into the magic lore. You're getting all of that stuff. So the end of season two, you get the classism angle. This dickhead knight, while they're trying to destroy this like magic tree, you know, that's really causing havoc. I think they call it trauma. They show up a few times here and there. They're trying to do that and blow up some other type of crazy monster. Mine is being protected. This guy you know, there's one guy is unsure of himself. There's another guy being a complete dickhead because she's a commoner and he doesn't like it. He doesn't understand it. And she's like pushing her to the ground and saying, you're nothing. You're a waste of space. The rest of the group gets screwed over because that guy's not doing his job. Ferdinand finds out and pulls rank and says, fuck you, get the fuck out. And, you know, more or less browbeats him, court martials him, almost kicks the shit out of him, but <laughs> intimidates him to the point where he is no longer a factor. And then people realize, oh, okay, yeah, she's important. And yes, she ends up showing off her powers, cleanses the problem, because Ferdinand knew it. They did not have any inclination that that's what she could do. So they learn their lesson. So season three rolls around and that's where the intrigue and stuff starts to go even further. You start seeing more of these rituals and more of this stuff as her station in life slowly improves. Her family is slowly becoming put on the back burner, even though she needs to be with her family for as long as she can. So they come up with this deal where it's like, hey, I'll be. I'll live with them here and there. I will work at the church and I'll work at the merchant guild and all that stuff. So you start seeing that the head priest and high priest keep batting heads, and the nobility starts getting involved, and they try to kidnap her all throughout the season. 
and another character shows up who pulls even higher rank. And at the end of season three, it changes completely. And there are some scenes at the end of season three that did tug at me a little bit because the show took its time. I know patience is not a thing that most of us like in this society, whether it's being social media, whether it's, you know, sports, TV shows, all that stuff. We want to be, in, you know, we want to get the instant gratification. This is not one of those because there's 36 episodes. And I'm I'm going to bet it's popular enough that they're going to be more um because there's more story to tell if they want to tell it because they're going in different directions. The show is willing to go taking you on different directions where it needs to go with its story so that it's never in the same place. I think if it was just trying to show you books and books and bookmaking and books and stuff, it would be very boring. But at the same time, it's not trying to inundate you with its world building right away. It's giving you one bit here and there, another bit in the second season, and then even more, but still giving you the character focus that you need. Um, as far as aesthetics, I, I do like that the magic is there, but it's not as in your face as some things. Again, it's not meant to be a shonen or anything like that. The magic is there when it needs to be. The character drama is still taking the focus. When it when it does the asides for the comedy and it does the goofy faces and the dumb things, it, again, it doesn't distract all that often. The thing that I notice very heavily is the faces. I've said this before in other shows. The Whether this was the style of the manga or just the way it was designed, like the way people smile, the, the way people look, the way their hair looks is just distinct. It's very colorful. For a world that is very kind of drab as a standard high fantasy kind of setting, it's it's very lovely to look at. Not in the animation sense, but just in the color sense. Just everybody looks interesting, and especially when you get the devouring and the eyes and all the shit happens. It, it uses color when it needs to. So it's, it's an interesting very substandard look for for most of the time but at the same time it's gripping you in other ways because it's not trying to overwhelm you with animations and crazy stuff going forward it's just there but it still strikes you whenever somebody is like smiling it looks very different i think it's like the tops of the mouths or something like their types of smiles are distinct like, I would never see that in any other type of anime. It's just, like, one big stripe. But it is, at the same time, it's very, it's like, it's a, it's a calming effect. It's an interesting effect. It's a, it's a, it's a nice effect to it. Um, the, as far as negatives go, um, again, taking a lot of the manga and just zipping through it. Like, you'll go through an episode and they'll just say, a season went by and now we do this. And another season went by an episode later and we do this. And now all of a sudden mine goes from like five or six to seven and eight and nine and ten and whatever in the span of like three seasons. And it's like, okay, I'm guessing that's just to save time on the fact that it's not a 24 episode show. It's, you know, 36 episodes over three seasons so far. So if you've gotten used to the manga and you're going super fast, and it feels like I'm losing a lot of details, that's probably why. I started with the show, so I, I'm only hearing about that as a criticism. But it is there. It is a show, some of the time, kind of slow. You know, Spice and Wolf moves, and again, I keep bringing that up because it has the same kind of vibe to it. Um, it moves at a good enough pace but it also doesn't. It's not trying to do hills and valleys outside of the flashes of intrigue. Once you get a thing, you're in there for the thing. If you like the first episode, you're gonna like the rest of it. It's not gonna try and be different. It doesn't, like, throw you for a loop. You know, it's not trying to be one thing and then suddenly trying to be everything else. It gives you enough time to build and that's why it's going from the negative to the positive here. 
is it's a lot of stuff about nothing, you know, in the grand scheme of things for a while. And then slowly it starts to, it wants you to understand who these characters are and invest in them at the times that it needs the investment when it starts to heat back up. So the bookmaking stuff is cool, and then they realize, you know, no, we've got another story we're going to tell. We're going to talk about how churches go and nobility works and magic and stuff like that. And then, you know, we pull back everything else and we start doing this story arc. We start doing a different one. But it doesn't feel unnatural because it all still feels in the same world. But it doesn't lose what it was trying to be, that sophisticated sense that it's the same level of uh, skill involved when you're making the first bits when you're making the second season under the third again this is a show that stays where it needs to stay it's not trying to reinvent itself but it's slowly doing so and evolving rather than oh here we go oh big part nope I mean yeah maybe the end of the season you have to have something important but the episodes themselves are going to be kind of the same quality for the same length of time. So if the first, you know, three to five episodes grab you, you're going to be okay. I ended up liking the show more on a rewatch just because I forgot that some of the intense and dramatic moments were as intense and dramatic as they were. So I ended up liking this a lot more on a rewatch. But if you're not somebody that gets into the first three or four episodes uh, again the three episode rule does really affect it but it's not going to like you know some shows i've heard have really cool you know first seasons and then they plummet shield hero part-timer you're not getting that you're getting that steady curve you know maybe a little lip here and there in better stuff and most time it's just gonna stay where it's gonna stay pretty good comfort show and sometimes that's what, that's all you need. A good show that's that knows what it's trying to be and takes you for different things here and there without overwhelming you all the time. So I would definitely recommend Ascendants of a Bookworm because if you feed into the, the world and the story and the characters, the characters will keep evolving, the world will keep evolving, but it will take you along for the ride fast enough that you don't feel bored but not so fast that you feel like you've been left behind and sometimes you need something that simple and it is a simple enjoyable show you can put it on and say this isn't the best thing i've ever seen it's not the best thing of any season that i'm gonna watch but i can watch it and keep going with it and enjoy it so that'll do it for me this week let's see what's on the docket going forward so, do, 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 do. next week I will talk about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the first movie. Oh, God, yes, I haven't seen that in forever, and I've been looking forward to it. Back, back, Blutler. No, back, I did it again. Back, Blutler. Black, Butler. There we fucking go. The first one was not intentional. The second time I tried to make it a joke, and then it still ended up unintentional. But Black, Butler. Got it that time. Master Detective Archives, Raincoat after that, The Helpful Fox, Senkosan, and after that we go back into gaming with Breath of Fire 2. So, I'm busy going forward and I know what I'm going to be doing. So, I shall see you guys next time. Citizen Strike, signing off.